let's uh, before we come uh, to to look at that passage verses 7 to 13 let's just uh, bow our heads in prayer once more father we thank you that uh, from the very beginning uh, the message of the gospel from jesus and also lord uh, from john the baptist was the same uh, to repent and believe and we we see here in this scripture lord how the disciples went two by two and went into the villages and spoke and pointed to the lord jesus christ and we pray father that that same gospel message is the same uh, message that this world in which we live needs to hear and understand uh, and believe in we thank you father uh, that the way into heaven is through jesus alone and father as we would come to the scriptures now we do ask your blessing upon the preaching of your word that your spirit uh, lord uh, will come and take of your word and plant that word in our minds but also in our hearts and that lord you will that it will bear fruit uh, it will encourage us and strengthen us and bless us <clears throat> and enable us lord we pray um, to be uh, faithful servants and that we ourselves might be disciples who, who will be able to go and tell others about jesus also we thank you for uh, uh, the fact lord that uh, it seems in, in the current situation in which we live that the vaccine uh, vaccines are going out and we thank you for the numbers of people that are, are having that vaccine now we, we think also lord uh, especially uh, of those who uh, are still struggling with uh, this pandemic, those uh, numbers, large numbers still in hospital. Uh, we think of the families, uh, the loved ones who are worrying. And Lord, we pray that you be merciful to them. We think of those, Lord, who have lost loved ones because of this uh, COVID-19. And pray, Father, you will be a comforter and a strength to them. But we pray, Father, that as we are going through these times uh, then lord you would use these times to be uh, a warning uh, a, a means of stirring up people's thoughts not not about themselves or about um, what they can't do but rather lord thinking about eternal things uh, thinking about the fact that uh, physically lord we are mortal beings and uh, one day we will die but also lord revealing to them that they have immortal souls immortal souls that will come before you and lord we pray that these days these events might be a, a time in which they people might ask and perhaps we also might be asking uh, where will i be in eternity and Lord, we pray that the answer that we will have and the answer that will be found will be will be found with you in Christ Jesus, through Christ Jesus. We pray for the churches, Lord, uh, today that are holding their services online. We know that uh, there are some, <coughs> Father, that haven't been able to or because of certain problems with their buildings and perhaps even legislation, as in Scotland, not able to open up their buildings not able to have those services but we thank you uh, that you enable us to um, have uh, sermons uh, messages the gospel being uh, proclaimed being preached as we do here online uh, this morning oh lord may it, may it be a blessing to many may it encourage your church and your people may it save souls we ask in jesus name amen amen right well let's uh, let's turn uh, to the word uh, to mark chapter six so i'm going to do a bit of a, a juggling act with uh, the table uh, i must admit that seeing myself sitting here in the armchair does remind me of jeremy baby but i'm not sure how he managed to do it uh, juggle his bible and his notes at the same time but uh, there we are um, so we, we're going uh, to Mark chapter 6 and uh, verses 7 to 13. And I think, uh, Rob, we've got a title, Rejecting Jesus 
is dangerous. Uh, thank you. Rob's doing the uh, slides uh, today, so uh, thanks, thanks uh, to Rob for that. Um, some years ago, in fact, probably too many years ago, I, I went to a, a minister's fraternal, and in the fraternal was uh, a man that I hadn't met before, but he had been a, a pastor of a church in Swansea. But uh, after becoming a pastor, he felt the call to become a missionary to Africa, uh, Central Africa. I think it was the uh, Democratic Republic of Congo, I think it's called these days. And uh, he had been a pastor there uh, to a little community um, of a few hundred folk uh, in, in that part of the world. And he had uh, been the pastor there for about 10 years. And in those 10 years, um, there had been not many, but a few had come to faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, and uh, they built a, a little little church, and uh, there was a little uh, fellowship that were meeting, and uh, he'd served that church uh, faithfully. When when I met him at the Minister of Return, he had just come back, uh, having finished his uh, um, being a missionary, and he was actually coming back to become a, a pastor in the area again. So it was a kind of a welcome back, a welcome home type of meeting. And he he shared with us uh, his his time uh, there for 10 years. And he said that there were a lot of joys with people uh, coming to faith in Christ and uh, the fellowship was good. But the sadness that he had was for the last 18 months while he was there. And it was part of the reason why he was coming back was that uh, in the, I, I'm not sure whether it was a village or a, I suppose we might call it a little town, I suppose, in that town that he was uh, ministering in, um, 18, year, 18 months before uh, uh, he left, uh, the Americans, as he put it, the Americans came into the town and uh, they, co they caused all many, all kinds of problems. Now, I'm not going to uh, have a go at Americans at all, uh, but basically, these Americans uh, that came into town were people who had come preaching health and wealth. Now, he wasn't preaching that, he was preaching the gospel. But they came in uh, preaching that if you believe in Jesus, everything in your life will be great. You'll have uh, all, uh, all your health problems will be uh, uh, solved. You have no money problems. You have all this money as well. And uh, you, obviously, that was the kind of message that the poor, uh, and uh, sick people of the area really wanted uh, to, to hear. They wanted to go there. What made it difficult for him is the very first thing that happened when they arrived is they built a much bigger, brand new building where they were having their meetings because they, they had lots and lots of money. Uh, they were coming with uh, brand new uh, Land Rovers, he said, satellite dishes so they could communicate with their home church in America and they were giving out free gifts of mobile phones. And so the problem was that within about three or four months, half his congregation had disappeared down to the, the church where the Americans had been had established. And, uh, and he, he asked one of the people who had been going to his church and he was now going uh, uh, to um, this American church, well, why are you going there? Uh, and the man said, well, your God doesn't seem to be as more, as powerful as the God of the Americans. And that was quite uh, sad, wasn't it? And quite uh, sobering, I think. Uh, and sometimes with evangelism, with sort of missionary work, sometimes people think that all you need to do is throw money at things and you'll get results. Well, the view of Jesus has about sending people out uh, with the gospel is completely different. And that's what we're going to be looking at uh, this morning, how Jesus sends out his disciples. And we're going to see it um, in verses uh, 7 to 13. And uh, thank you, Rob. I got ahead, too, ahead of myself too much on, on that one. Right. Well, if I can have the first... Uh, Points put up, uh, please. Right, 
rejecting Jesus is dangerous, we're saying that's the overall title. But the first point is he sent them out with power. He sent them out with power. And we read this in verse 7. So uh, I th think we probably got a, the reading text there, yes, we have. And he called the 12 to himself. Those are the 12 disciples. And if you read other parallel passages in Luke and Matthew, uh, they have Jesus picking these 12 disciples uh, at this point. So these 12 have been chosen. And he called the 12 to himself and began to send them out two by two and gave them power over unclean spirits. Now, the point is that Jesus is giving them power. And we know that Jesus has power because we've seen it in the previous chapters of this gospel. In the previous chapter, chapter 5, we saw there that Jesus had the power to raise a little girl who had died to life again. And also Jesus, through the other chapters, we've seen that he's had the power to drive out uh, demons. You know, remember the man called Legion, who was uh, had so many uh, so many demons that the demons uh, left him and they they went into the the pigs that you you remember. So the power that Jesus gives them is the power of himself, the power that he was able to to, to give uh, that came from him to heal people to drive out demons and uh, even uh, uh, to raise somebody from the dead. But it's also the authority of Jesus that's that's uh, given to these disciples. They were going out in the name of Jesus. Um, and that was the authority they had in regard to the healing and regard to um, the raising from the dead. And... Uh, if we go to verse 13, we can see that demonstrated uh, for us. Verse 13 says, And they cast out many demons and anointed with oil many who were sick and healed them. So it's not a power in themselves. It's uh, Christ's power at work in them. And, and that's very important, uh, I think. Uh, we need to understand that. Uh, you know, when someone comes to uh, to believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, uh, we need to understand it's not that they suddenly woke up one morning and they could come to the Lord Jesus Christ themselves, that they've had some great uh, uh, idea in their mind that Jesus was the Savior and it's all about how they were able to come to Jesus. That doesn't happen. It's it, it God who opens the mind that enables uh, people to come to faith in in Christ. It's not the um, it's not the preacher. Uh, it's not the, or the evangelists. In a sense, it's not even in the Bible in a way. Um, but rather, it's all from Jesus. And sometimes it takes years for for Christians uh, to really understand. When they speak about how they 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 are Christians, uh, it takes them years to understand that it's not it's not uh, not that they believed, although that's true, but rather that God had done that work in their souls first. It was the Holy Spirit, for example, that opened their eyes uh, to see that God is always the initiator of our salvation, and we see that in the Scripture, for example. Uh, we read about uh, God uh, before eternity, choosing, choosing rather, his uh, people. Uh, God sending out Jesus, the Son of God, to become a man, to die on that cross. It's God being the initiator. It's God uh, opening the heart of a lady called Lydia uh, so that she could hear the gospel and believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. So we got to remember, I think, that all this power and this authority that we're reading from that's been given to the disciples is power and authority of Jesus, and not something that's uh, with these uh, disciples in and of themselves. Because sometimes you might meet Christians 
who will say, oh, I've got the gift of this, or I've got the gift of healing, or I've got the gift of prophecy, or I've got the gift of this or that or the other. And that's not really true. If it's a genuine gift, it has come from God. Uh, and God has given the power and the authority for them to exercise uh, those gifts. There's an example of this. I think it puts it quite clearly, really. It's in uh, Daniel chapter 5, and it's the chapter where Daniel, uh, who has become quite an old man by now, uh, he's, he, he's brought in to, uh, to see the king of Babylon, Belshazzar. Who's, uh, we're not sure entirely how that works out in the Hebrew, but he's either the son or the grandson of Nebuchadnezzar. Um, and there's been some writing on the wall. He's had, there's this, they've been feasting, they've been using the, uh, uh, the utensils and the cups from the temple at Jerusalem, and they've been boasting about their gods, and this hand appears and there's writing on the wall, and they don't understand it. And they're all shocked. And, and what happens is that uh, the Queen Mother says, oh, yes, I remember there was a man called Daniel. Uh, he was an interpreter of dreams and could understand all mysteries. And they, they bring Daniel in and uh, Belshazzar flatters Daniel. You know, I've heard that you're a great, uh, you're a great understander of dreams and stuff like that. And uh, Daniel replies to Belshazzar that he, he has no uh, gift of understanding. He, he can't interpret any dreams or, or, or the writing that's on the wall. But he says, but my God can. And that's the point, uh, the, the power and the authority that comes all, all the while from Jesus. So Jesus sends out what we might describe as a, a bunch of nobodies, because that's really what those disciples are. Uh, as, as far as the Pharisees and Sadducees are concerned, they're a bunch of nobodies. They're just fishermen and tax collectors and uh, 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 an ex-terrorist, uh, a bunch of nobodies. He sends them out as his servants. Why? Because the glory is to be to God and to Jesus. He's not sending them out that they can get glory and fame and reputation for themselves, but he's sending these people out so that the glory comes back uh, to Jesus. Well, let's move on to the second point. And if we have the next slide, the second point is this. He, he sent them out with very little. Let me read verse 8 and verse 9 uh, to you. Verse 8, verse 9. He commanded them to take nothing for the journey except a staff. Uh, one translation has walking stick. I quite like that. But it, it's a staff. Uh, and that was used for fighting uh, against animals and enemies as well. But uh, a staff, no bag, no bread, no copper in their money belts, but to wear sandals and not to put on two tunics. Uh, and you read that and you think, wow, you know, how are they going to cope? You know, how are they going to survive? So basically, Jesus is, is sending them out with so, so very little. Uh, and how are they going to go around in all, all these villages? They've got no money. They've got no food. Uh, they haven't got much in the way of, uh, of belongings at all. Uh, you know, not, not two overcoats, just a coat uh, and so on. But the problem, the thing is that we need to be careful. We don't put a, a 21st century gloss on the first century here, because in one sense, it's a different culture to the the Western culture that we have today. If this, if we if we try to do this today and say, right, I'm going to go into um, uh, some part of Bristol, I've got no money and I've got no food, and I'm going to knock on a door and they're going to, they're going to let me in, you think, well, you've got no chance. It's never going to happen. But in the first century, uh, it was part of being uh, being Jewish, and they saw it as part of of, of the, the Jewish culture and the laws of Moses, that Jewish people were to be kind uh, to the, the, uh, the, the what what's, the Bible often describes as sojourners, the the travelers, the strangers that come into their um, their villages or their towns. They had they were to be hospitable, and it's a long tradition that we that that, that we see uh, takes place. We see it 
for example, in, in, in Abraham, with Abraham, in Genesis chapter 18, three people come into Abraham's camp, and uh, before he really knows who they are, and it turns out to be two angels and the Lord Jesus, but before he knows who they are, he's already got Sarah to, to run to the servants, and they start um, make, baking the bread and roasting, roasting the calf. Uh, he's being hospitable, he's being generous. <coughs> and the ancient world uh, was like that. Uh, and in fact, uh, I'm assured, and I've seen it firsthand as well, that it's also true in many other cultures other than our own. Um, for example, that was one of the things we noticed when Jane and I went to uh, Siberia and amongst the Uzbek people, when we arrived, you know, strangers, they'd never, they'd never met us before, they couldn't even speak our language, well, we couldn't speak theirs, and uh, they, they shouted, well, one of the first things we had was a great big uh, loaf of bread that was given to us, that had been baked that day for us, and we went there and there was this table and it was full of food and uh, and uh, lots of stuff I couldn't recognize and I wasn't sure whether you're supposed to eat it or not, but um, it was Uzbek food that was there waiting for us. Uh, in this place that we were, were staying, and it was a tremendous act of hosp hospitality and generosity. So it's not quite the same as our own uh, day and age. Uh, as a stranger going into a, a village situation or a town, um, people would be uh, drawn to open their homes or share their hospitality with them. So it isn't so much of a, a, a shock for them, I don't suppose, but there's the full question about rejecting, rejecting the visitors, and uh, Jesus uh, does that, uh, doesn't he? He mentions it uh, there in the next two verses, if we can have that, please, verses 10 to 11, coming up. Uh, let me read it to you. Uh, also, he said to them, in whatever place you enter a house, stay there till you depart from that place. And whoever will not receive you, nor hear you, when you depart from there, shake off the dust under your feet as a testimony against them. But surely I say to you, it will be more tolerable for Sodom and Gomorrah in the day of judgment than for that city. So Jesus isn't really talking about that, that they may be rejected, uh, the, his disciples, but Rather, it was the rejection of uh, the, the gospel message. But also what the disciples are being taught here is that that of self-reliance uh, is, is not rather of self-reliance, but of God-reliance. They were to rely on God in their going, or rely on Jesus, if you like, uh, in their going to the villages. Uh, they would have hospitality. That would be the normal practice. But if they reject it, it's because of the gospel that they were preaching. It was because of the message that they had concerning Jesus. And uh, well, that's um, this aspect of um, God reliance is something that uh, uh, I know my daughter uh, has found difficult as a missionary. Um, you know, dependent upon the uh, generosity of, of believers, the generosity of of churches uh, for, for her to be able to be involved in, in, in that work. And uh, I know that she often has problems uh, when she's been home and she's been speaking at a meeting and, and, and accepting gifts from folk. Um, but that's part of, of, of ministry. That's part of being a Christian. It's, it's very biblical, isn't it, uh, to, to uh, support uh, God's servants. But hospitality also is something important. I think it's something we wouldn't, we shouldn't just uh, um, uh, skim over here. Uh, the generosity that was to be given to these disciples. I mean, imagine that they must have had quite a bit of hospitality and generosity because when you get to verse 13, we haven't, I don't no need to, to read it, but um, we, we, we hear that they were able to do a great deal. They were casting out demons, they were anointing, with oil, many who were sick, and they were being healed. So there was obviously a ministry that they were able to exercise that was appreciated there. So I thought, it, uh, before we move on to the next uh, point, is this. When the pandemic is over, uh, at the moment we can't do much hospitality, can we? <laughs> uh, 
we're not allowed to have anybody in our homes. Uh, well, I'm not sure actually what the exact rule was, but uh, more or less, we're not supposed to have anybody in our homes. And uh, but when the pandemic is over, um, let's not just get ourselves in a kind of a kind of rut uh, because um, uh, we got so used to not having people and not doing hospitality. Perhaps after the pandemic is over, let's see if we we can't entertain uh, those angels that uh, we find in uh, Hebrews chapter 13 and verses 1 to 3. And that's another slide that Rob, I think, should have for us. Hebrews 13, 1 to 3. He says, uh, right of the Hebrews, which I think is Paul anyway, says, let brotherly love continue. Do not forget to entertain strangers, or by so, by, by so doing, some have unwittingly entertained angels or not. I think that word unwittingly is perhaps a, a little bit odd uh, for our day and age, but uh, but we, uh, you know, we're doing the Lord's work. Maybe we even entertain angels. Remember prisoners as if they're chained with them, those who are mistreated since you yourselves are in a body also. There's an aspect of, of Christian ministry uh, that we can have, can't we, uh, with regard to hospitality, generosity, uh, thinking of others, uh, indeed, uh, we take Paul um, in Ephesians 2, thinking others better uh, than ourselves. Well, let's move on to the, the third point uh, at this, uh, this stage. And uh, he sent them out to preach the good news. And uh, we need to go to verse 12 to see what he has been telling them. Uh, so Mark chapter 6 and verse 12. Uh, so they went out and preached that people should repent. Now, it doesn't seem uh, much really, but if you put that all together, uh, what, what that's telling us, it's a kind of a code, if you like, that the, what the disciples were doing were, was exactly the same thing that Jesus was doing. And indeed, we could say it was the same thing that John the Baptist was doing. And the message of Jesus was... Uh, to repent and believe. Now, John the Baptist's uh, preaching was repent and believe in the coming of the Messiah. Jesus' message was repent and believe because the coming kingdom has arrived. In other words, it, it arrived because it arrived with Jesus, because Jesus is the Christ. And that was Jesus' message. And so the disciples... Uh, we're preaching the same thing. Repent, turn away from your sins, turn to God. And uh, no doubt, as they were preaching that good news, they were pointing to Jesus. Repent, uh, turn away from your sins, believe in God, believe in Jesus as we do, as the Messiah, uh, the Christ. And that's our wonderful message too, isn't it? Uh, our message is the same as the disciples, is the same message as Jesus, the same message as John the Baptist. Uh, turn away from your sins, turn to God, believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. Uh, John the Baptist's message was that to believe in the one who is to come. And in a sense, we've got that message ourselves, haven't we? Because it's not only to believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, uh, believing that he paid for uh, our sins on the cross, but also to tell folk, and perhaps we don't make much of this, to tell folk that the Lord Jesus Christ is coming again and he's going to come in judgment. And are we ready? Are people ready to face judgment? Well, we can face the judgment of God, can't we, when Jesus comes again? But only if we have faith in Jesus only because Jesus has paid the price for all our sins, uh, only because we can stand before Almighty God, clothed in righteousness, but not uh, our righteousness, because the Bible tells us that's just uh, filthy rags, but clothed in his righteousness. And God, as he looks upon us, doesn't see our sins. He sees his son, Jesus. And that's the only way to go to salvation. And so the gospel message the disciples had is the same message that we have, 
And we also have that message to say Jesus is going to come again. And the way of salvation is this, really. Turning away from our sins, repenting of our sins, saying to God, you know, I really did, I really have messed up. And I really deserve your anger. But to believe in Jesus and to thank God the Father for Jesus, who took all God's anger, God's wrath upon himself, and by his death, wiped away the blackboard of our sins. Those sins which were written down against us, which have now been cleared away by Christ's blood, never ever to be written down in, God, in God's uh, book of judgment. Well, let's uh, go to the fourth point. And the fourth point is this. He warns of the danger of rejecting the gospel. And uh, that's verse 10 uh, and, and 11. He says uh, to his disciples, in whatever place you enter a house, stay there till you depart from that place. And whoever will not receive you, nor hear you, when you depart from there, shake off the dust under your feet as a testimony against them. As surely I say to you, it will be more tolerable for Sodom and Gomorrah in the day of judgment than for that city. Well, those, verse, those words in verse 11 are quite sobering and serious, aren't they? One of the, uh, the saddest things that you read in the whole of Scripture, I think, uh, was something we saw last Sunday morning. It's when Jesus uh, went to Nazareth. Now, you would have imagined that uh, Jesus has, has, been having, has had a bit of a reputation by this stage as being a, a man of God, a holy man of God, a healer, a teacher. Uh, you would have imagined that when he went back to his home village of Nazareth, they would have welcomed him. They might have had the bunting out. They would have been people on the streets cheering. But it didn't work out like that, did it? Uh, as we saw last week, they rejected him. They simply said, who does this guy think that he is? You know, we know, we know where he comes from. We know his family background. And uh, the, the parallel passages in Matthew and, and Luke uh, tell us that they attempted to kill him. And it, it, it's very, very serious that the uh, people of Nazareth, the people who should know better, didn't, and rejecting him. And we, we read that for ourselves, don't we, in verses 4 uh, and 5, where Jesus speaks about his rejection of their offence. Uh, but Jesus said to them, a prophet is not without honour except in his own country, among his own relatives and in his own house. Now he could do no mighty work there, except that he laid his hands on a few sick people and healed them. But the rejection of Jesus goes further than just uh, the little village of Nazareth. It will extend to towns. It will extend to people in Jerusalem as well. And it will extend to all the villages and all the little communities that the disciples disciples went to and jesus tells them uh, his disciples that if they are rejected if people uh, uh, want to throw them out of their little village or they won't find any hospitality there they would shake off the dust under uh, their feet now what's that all about well there was a custom that uh, the jews uh, did uh, and this is long before the days of, G of Jesus, and I gather it was a custom that the Jews, uh, having been uh, in a Gentile land, uh, for, for example, if you were, uh, Jesus did this uh, on a few occasions in order to travel from Galilee uh, to Judah, you, the, the shortcut was to go through Samaria. So if you went through Samaria, by the time you got to the border with Judah, uh, you would uh, knock all the all the dirt of Samaria out of your sandal. You would uh, uh, shake off the dust of your feet, and they uh, and they were doing that symbolically uh, to say, really, that they were separate. They were a separate people. Uh, they were God's people from 
uh, separate from the Gentiles, separate from the Samaritans, uh, and they were uh, knocking off the dust off their feet, uh, but separating them from the Gentile practices and influences. It was a, a declaration that said that they had they were journey, they had journeyed through Gentile land, and that Gentile land had made them unclean in the sight of God, and that the dust that was sort of left behind was a to be a, a kind of sign to the Gentiles that uh, those lands would be under judgment. And that's what Jesus is saying here with his, about his disciples, that by kicking off the, the dust from their sandals, from the places where they've been rejected, uh, they, these places would now be under a, a time of judgment of God. And it wasn't only their, those places, Jesus, of course, and another place speaks about the judgment against Capernaum and other places where uh, he, he he was going to visit and uh, their judgment was, wasn't going to be as bad as Sodom and Gomorrah, which is also mentioned in that verse. But uh, a lot of the villages, uh, it seems, uh, uh, were being blessed. And uh, we see that in verse 13. If we can have that uh, slide, please. Or not. Verse 13, and they cast out many demons. That's the, that's the, uh, the disciples, as I said, that obviously suggests that they were welcomed in many places uh, and anointed with all many who were sick and healed them. So, uh, but others, of course, were under uh, the judgment of, uh, of God uh, and Jesus tells them this in verse 11 of that same passage and whoever will not receive you nor hear you when you depart from this shake off the dust under your feet as a testimony against them it's a it's a statement that they're under judgment but surely i say to you it will be more tolerable for sodom and gomorrah in the day of judgment than for that city or that uh, village whenever we uh, speak uh, of Jesus to someone, well, uh, whenever we preach to good the good news of Jesus, there's there's going to be a reaction. Uh, we pray and we ask that it'll be a positive one, uh, but it's also going to be possibly a, a negative one. We need to realise that the words that we are uh, saying and we as we speak and share the gospel with somebody or we share our testimony with somebody or we speak about the Lord Jesus Christ are not just words, um, uh, words that can disappear. But if you are a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ, those words that you've spoken, and it doesn't matter whether you're an evangelist or whatever you are, or a missionary, uh, if you're a Christian and you've spoken about Jesus and you've spoken about the gospel and you perhaps you've shared your testimony, then those words that you, you've, you've used, that you've spoken with, uh, have the power and the authority of Jesus upon them. And if people respond and believe in the message of Jesus, then we can praise God for that. It's, uh, it's God is at work and, uh, and that to save. But if the people reject the message, and I want to make the emphasis here that it's for these disciples, it wasn't that they were necessarily dis rejecting the disciples, but they were rejecting the message of the disciples. But if people reject the message, uh, they're not necessarily rejecting us, but they are rejecting Jesus. And they therefore move themselves nearer uh, to judgment and further away from God. Verse 11 again. And whoever will not receive you, nor hear you, when you depart from there, shake off the dust under your feet as a testimony against them. Assuredly, I say to you, it will be more tolerable for Sodom and Gomorrah in the day of judgment than for that city. So uh, as we close uh, this morning, let me ask this question of us all, really. Dear friend, where do you stand today? Are you rejecting the good news of Jesus? Are you rejecting uh, the gospel message? It's like somebody I met many, many years ago. Um, 
<clears throat> when I was um, before I went before I went to Bible College and became a pastor, and I used to do a lot of uh, itinerary uh, itinerant preaching as a lay preacher, and I remember going to some very peculiar churches, as one does, and uh, meeting someone uh, there who was a member of this particular church. And uh, he said to me, you know, I like the church and I like the people of this church. And this is after I, I preached the gospel. But he said, I don't like the gospel. And that was so sad that somebody who is rejecting Jesus. Oh, yes, he's he's quite pally with Christians and he likes the sort of Christian service. But he doesn't want the Lord Jesus Christ. And Jesus is telling us here in these passages, and he's telling these disciples also, that those who are rejecting the message, rejecting the gospel, they're rejecting him, Jesus, and they're in eternal danger, and they're on the road to hell. Let me ask again, dear friend, have you heard the good news? The good news that Jesus died in your place. You should be punished by God the Father for your sins and for your unbelief and your ungodlinesses. But Jesus is punished in, in my place. Jesus paid for all our sins, past, present, future sins. It's all been wiped away in the blood of Christ so that we can stand before holy God clothed in the righteousness of Jesus so that God the Father sees us as he sees Jesus and if you hear the good news and you believe in the good news of Jesus then Jesus has opened heaven for you not for a short while but for eternity and what are we to do if we have not got Jesus in our life yet well it's this welcome him Open your heart, your arms to him. Open your heart to Jesus. Say to him, come, Lord Jesus. Come into my heart. Amen. Amen. Well, let's uh, let's close in prayer uh, at this point. Let's pray. Uh, Father, we thank you again. For this wonderful message that Jesus left the realms of heaven and came down, came down to be our Saviour and our Lord. Father, we ask and pray uh, that we all may examine our hearts this morning, that we might all, Lord, be those who can say, I heard the message, I heard the gospel. I know Jesus is Saviour and Lord, and he is my Saviour and my Lord. That we might all be able to say, it's not that I have anything within me, or nothing about my personality, or my mind, or my intellect, but it's all of Jesus. I couldn't save myself, but Jesus saved me. And we praise you and thank you, Father, that that's true for every single believer. We were all on that road to hell. But you broke into our lives. You opened our eyes, you opened our minds, you opened our hearts to Jesus. Praise you that he is the author and finisher of our faith. And we praise you and thank you that we are going to be with our Lord Jesus in eternity. So, Father, in our small ways that we try to share something of the gospel with others. We pray, Father, that we may not be feeling that people are rejecting us when they will not have Jesus to be their saviour, but to realise that it's the message. And we pray, Father, that we might be hospitable and generous. Uh, that's a uh, through our hospita hospit hospitality and generosity, the gospel may also advance. Oh, Father, we pray again that your good hand will be upon us to bless us for good. 
and we thank you, Father, that we've been able to to meet uh, this morning and to hearing once more uh, the good news of the gospel. Now may the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the Son of God and the love of God the Father and the fellowship of God the Holy Spirit be with us all now and forevermore. Amen. Amen.